I really want to encourage you to come and uh, on the 12th for the Sunday School pageant. I have had the privilege of being out, out in the portable as they have prepared, and it is, we have some very, very talented children, and I would encourage you to come and hear them as they bring the message that morning. This morning, though, we are beginning our series in Advent, so we've stopped the Roman series for a little bit, just a pause, and we're going to um, talk about hope. Helen read from Hebrews 11, where it says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. In our world, hope is this maybe, maybe not iffy kind of context. We use it as a verb and we say we hope that such and such will happen. It might be that we are hoping that we will get what we want for Christmas, what we long for for Christmas. And if you're really good at dropping hints or even maybe writing out exactly what you want and handing it to the uh, a person who's going to supply it, you will, that hope will probably be realized. But there's always the uncertainty. I don't know if you've ever dropped hints about something, hoping it would occur, and it and you can't figure out how that got missed. And we use, so we use hope in that sense. And sometimes the odds uh, of your hope being realized are better than others. So you can buy a lottery ticket and hope that you will win the lottery. But the odds on any given time are like one in 500 million or something, especially if the jackpot is 60 million or whatever. Not very good odds. And sometimes the odds are like Christmas presents. But that's not what biblical hope is. Biblical hope is being certain of what you're hoping for. I think a good definition of it is confident expectation. We know it's going to happen. The uncertainty in biblical hope is when. God has said it will occur, and often as you go through scripture, you will see that God says something is going to happen. God tells Abraham he's going to have a son. Abraham knows that's true. He's going to have a son, but he waits a long time before that son is born. David is told he is going to be king, and he waits a period of time. And really, as you look through the Psalms, that is one of the meanings of hope um, in Scripture. It, when you see David in despair, we know that between the time he is told he will be king and he becomes king, he lives in caves, he's on the run, he fears for his life, he lives in Philistine territory. Life is not going the way someone expected. I mean, Charles is going to be one day, Prince Charles is one day going to be king. And that road has been relatively smooth in terms of, of what is going to happen. But David's road was really rough. And as we read in the Psalms, we hear David in despair and almost hopeless. But then he says, I know where my hope is in God, and because of that, I can continue and go on. I know I will one day be king, not because of his own efforts, but because God had promised it. And we see other verses in Psalms, in, in scripture that say that. So Psalm 119 verse 81 says, my soul faints with longing for your salvation, but I have put my hope in your word. And Psalm 130 says, I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. And so scriptural hope, biblical hope, is hope in what God will happen. But hope is used in a different way as well in scripture. For Psalm 75 verse 5 says, For you have been my hope, sovereign Lord, my confidence since my youth. And Jeremiah 17, 13 says, Lord, you are the hope of Israel. And in 1 Timothy, Paul says of Christ, uh, uh, he said, Paul, an apostle, by the command of God our Savior and of Jesus Christ our hope. 
And so there is this element in the concept of hope that hope is God. It's one of his attributes, but it is who he is. And when we talk about putting our, having hope, we have not only hope in what God's word has said, but really our hope is rooted in God. And so this morning, we're going to talk about Simeon. And a few weeks ago in Romans, I talked about how Simeon is one of my favorite biblical characters. And it's partially based on the fact that when my kids were young, uh, we read them arch books every night going to bed. And one of my favorite arch books was Simeon. And so if I got to pick, we read Simeon. And we could all quote Simeon, that book, arch book, word for word, because I had read it so often to them. And also, Michael Card has a lovely song about Simeon. And if you know me really well, I'm not musical. I'm not really into music, but I love that song. And so we're going to get to see Simeon, who grew up hoping for the Messiah to come. He had grown up from probably the first time he could hear anything or understand anything of talk about the coming Messiah. The nation of Israel, the people of Israel, had been waiting centuries for God to fulfill this promise. God had promised over and over and over again, he was going to send the Savior. He was going to send the one who would defeat sin and, would, and death and would cross Satan's head right back in Genesis 3. But Simeon would have known that from a very young age. Imagine every year when they celebrated the Passover. And kids are curious. He probably said, why is there an empty chair there? And they, he, they would have explained. There's an empty chair there because Elijah's coming back. And when he comes back, that signal, that's going to be the signal that the Messiah is coming. And they would have talked about the Passover lamb and what it meant. And they would have just, his family would have shared this. He would have live and lived that hope that the Messiah was coming. And so we're going to look at Simeon's story this morning and the hope he had in his hope who was coming. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for your word. And I thank you in particular this morning for this passage in which we see Jesus, who is the Messiah, and who is acknowledged as the hope of not only the Israelites, but of all mankind. Amen. I'm going to read this morning from Luke 22 to chapter 2, 22 to 35. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Mary and Joseph took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves and two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he saw the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, This child is destined for the cause to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your soul too. And so the setting this morning is the temple in Jerusalem, and Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus have come up to the temple, and they have come to present Jesus to God. And that's a little ironic, because they have known each other from eternity. 
uh, and um, they are well acquainted. But scripture makes it clear that Mary and Joseph are coming up to fulfill the law. And Christ tells us in Matthew 5 that he didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And in doing this, they are fulfilling the law, and they bring Jesus up to the temple. And then we meet Simeon, and actually quite often in scripture, we know very little about people. Um, especially, I would say, in the New Testament. Um, people Jesus healed, the centurion servant, no name. Um, the woman with bleeding, no name. The woman at the well, the lepers. We don't have any, we don't really have any great detail about most of them. But about Simeon, this is what we know. We know that he was righteous, and he was devout, and he was waiting for the Messiah to come. And he had the Holy Spirit on him. Wouldn't you love someone to write that about you? That is amazing. We don't see that description of people very often in Scripture. This was a special man. But more than that, Simeon had been promised by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he saw the Messiah, the one not only he was hoping for, but his whole nation was hoping for, the Messiah, the hope of Israel. And we don't know how old Simeon is, but we assume he's fairly old because he says when he sees Jesus, um, you can now take me home, I'm ready to die. So we can assume he's fairly old. And we don't know at what age um, he was told that he would see the Messiah. But giving past history, we look in the Old Testament, usually God tells people something, and then there is a period of waiting, Abraham, David, and others. So I think we can assume fairly safely that there was a time in which this did not happen. And Simeon was waiting in hope, waiting in hope every day. But you know what we do know about Simeon was that he used that time waiting really wisely. And we're going to see that as what, in what he says about Jesus. But he spent his time studying who the Messiah would be and what he would do. And so we can see that because we know that Simeon was looking for a baby. Scripture doesn't say, oh, he was surprised that this was a baby, because Simeon would have known um, Isaiah 7.14. It says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will con conceive and give, him birth to a, give birth to a son, and you will call him Emmanuel. Simeon was expecting a baby. And then I wonder, as he waited and he hoped, probably every day, is, are you going to do it today, Lord? Have you ever been there? Are you going to do it today, Lord? He's promised something and you're wondering every day. But I wonder what it would have been like, because we know he lived in Jerusalem, so he must have been familiar with ha what, what happened to Zechariah. Zechariah is a priest, and he goes into the temple at Jerusalem, and he's going to offer the um, incense offering. And so he goes into the holy place, and he um, is there for a long time. And the people are getting concerned because he's been um, a long time. And it says in Luke 1, Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he had stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but he remained unable to speak. And he was unable to speak question what the angel said to him. He wasn't able to speak until after his son John was born. And we don't know how long that period is because it, scripture tells us he had to finish his service, then he had to go home, then his wife had to get pregnant. And so it's a while. But then when John is born, the son Zechariah was promised, I am sure the full story came out. I am sure when they came up to the temple to present John to God, 
as a firstborn son. They, Zachariah was excited and telling everybody, and probably he, we have it as a song, but it was probably the story he told over and over with everybody he met. And what he said was, and you, my child, speaking of John, shall be called a prophet of the Most High, and you will go before the Lord to prepare the way for him. Can you imagine how excited Simeon must have been? must have been getting. Still, he was waiting in hope because we know that Jesus is at least six months younger than um, his cousin John. And so they're still waiting in hope. But he would have realized that the message in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, had come true. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. And listen to this. And then suddenly, the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. He would have known that verse. Can you imagine how excited he is when he hears from Zechariah that John is that messenger that's coming? What hope he had. God had promised him. He knew it was going to come true. And he is excited. This prophecy has been fulfilled. But still, he had to wait. And he waited. And this morning when Les did communion, he talked about the fact that the shepherds shared the good news that they had heard from the angel. And Jerusalem is a little over nine kilometers from... um, Bethlehem is a little over nine kilometers from Jerusalem. And... um, Not very far. Actually, they said it was a 40-minute bike ride. Uh, We know we can probably walk it in under two hours. And so, and the sheep that the shepherds were raising were probably being raised to be taken to the temple. And so their news would have gotten back to Jerusalem. And can you imagine how excited Simeon would have been as he heard that good news, as Les read, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you, the Messiah, the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And he would have again known that where this baby was born was significant because in Micah 5 2, it says, In you, Bethlehem, through though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come one who will be the ruler over Israel whose origins are from old, from ancient times. He would have known that. Can you imagine? I don't know what you're like when you're excited or you're anticipating, you're hoping for something. I can remember my first grandchild was born, and we got on, she was born in Edmonton, and we got on that airplane in Ottawa and flew out to Edmonton and uh, got on a bus to go to a bus stop where somebody was going to pick us up and drive us to the house. And um, I can remember that I was so excited. Was just what we'd been hoping for for nine months had finally happened. And I was excited. But I have to say I was a little, uh, maybe not quite Um, as gracious I could be as I was waiting because I wanted to get there faster and as the bus hit traffic jams and stuff I I, I probably wasn't quite as gracious as I should be and uh, but finally we get there we get in the car we get to the house and their car is there because my granddaughter was coming for home from the hospital that day and we went in the house and we saw this baby I can't imagine I mean, my joy was so great. It was greater than I could have imagined or hoped for. But I can't imagine what Simeon's was. Because Simeon, finally the day comes, and Simeon sees, probably across a crowded area in the temple, he sees that baby, the one he's been looking for, the one he knows is the hope of Israel for the whole nation. And he moves across the floor and gets to them, and he takes that baby in his arms. I think the joy, his joy, is indescribable. 
to actually hold the Messiah in his arms, the hope of Israel. And he says, when he does that, he says, can't find the passage in my Bible, it's right here. He says, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for the Gentiles and the glory of the, your people Israel. I can't imagine his joy. But can you imagine Mary and Joseph's joy? They knew that Jesus was special. An angel had said to Joseph, take Mary home as your wife because she has conceived in her, what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from his, their sins. He had told Mary back in, in Luke, the angel had come to her, and the angel had said um, about Jesus, he will bring many back of the people back to Israel. And, he, and it's just amazing. Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and be called the Son of the Most High. They knew those things, but Simeon knew them as well. Simeon was proclaiming what they knew to be true to them. It must have increased their joy greatly. And then um, we see that Simeon really understood who Jesus was. He understood the passages from Isaiah and um, in Isaiah 9, 2 and in Isaiah 42, verse 7, that say that salvation is coming not only for the nation of Israel, but for the Gentiles as well. Simeon understood Christ was just not for the Jewish people, but for everyone. And then Simeon shows how much he truly understood why Jesus, the Messiah, had come. And he says to Mary, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soil, so, soul too. Simeon understood that Jesus came to die. He was looking for a savior who was coming not to save the nation of Israel politically, but he was looking for a savior who was coming to save the nation of Israel spiritually. He was coming to die to pay the penalty for our sins and to make us right with God. Many in Israel were looking for a spiritual savior to come. I mean, a, a political savior to come. But not Simeon. He was looking for a spiritual savior because he knew Isaiah chapter 52 and 53. And I'm only going to read one verse from that passage, but I would encourage you this today to go home and read that passage. But I'm going to read Isaiah 53, verse 12, which says, Therefore I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore men, the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressions. Simeon understood that his hope, the Messiah, was going to set his people spiritually free. He was going to pay the penalty for their sins and restore their relationship with God. He understood when many did not, 
And that is so exciting. Jesus hope, Simeon's hope was Jesus, the promised savior of the world. And I'm asking you this morning, is, G, is Jesus your hope? Or is your hope based on your talents, your abilities, your wealth, your physical gifts, maybe your hopes in the lottery? I have to tell you this morning that any hope that is not Jesus is a hope that will disappoint, will lead to unhappiness, and ultimately to death. Only by making Jesus our hope Will that hope lead to a life filled with love, joy, peace, forgiveness, and eternal life? And if you would like that hope today, then you need to agree that God and that you do not have a relationship with him. The things you have said and thought and done have created a gap between you and God. And that Jesus, the Messiah, the hope of everyone, has repaired that gap when he came, born as a baby, to bring hope into the world, when he came as that baby and then went on to choose to die. He offered to be that bridge between you and God, if you will allow him to. And that's what you have to do. You have to choose to choose Jesus as your hope. You have to choose to choose him. And if you do that, then he will come and live in you and give your life hope. Hope in a way that you have never understood before. And if you'd like to do that today, I just ask you to pray with me. Jesus, I know that you are the only bridge between God and myself. And I know that that gap exists. And I accept your offer to be my personal bridge, to pay for the wrongs I have done. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and become my hope today. If you've prayed that prayer today for the first time, I would encourage you to share it with someone else. And if you're here and you've done it for the first time, I pray, I ask that you would share it with somebody who you're with or somebody who's been on the stage tonight, today, so that we can share in your joy and in your hope and we can encourage you to get to know Jesus better. But if you already know Jesus as your hope, then I really want to encourage you to not waste your time that you have. I want to encourage you to spend it as Simeon did, getting to know Jesus, the Messiah, your hope better. Spend more time in God's word. Spend more time praying. Spend more time in fellowship, getting to know the one who is your hope. And if you do that, then we will be, you will be able to live in joyful, confident expectation of what he has promised us. New life, forgiveness, love, joy, peace, and above all else, the assurance that one day we, like Simeon, will see our hope face to face. Can you imagine the joy we will experience when that occurs? And so I encourage you this morning to spend time getting to know him better before you meet him face to face. Amen.